What's up, Latinx gaming community? I hope everyone's enjoying the broadcast today. My name is Jose Hernandez, but all my friends call me show. I am the lead animator for the League of Legends skins team. Today I'm going to be creating, um, presenting a uh, presentation on the creation of the Luchador skin line, which is actually one of my favorite skin lines of all. The agenda for today is going to be separated into a few different parts. I'm going to do an intro talking about myself, my story, how I got into gaming, how I became an animator, the luchador skins. And then at the end, I'm going to do an animation deep dive on the creation of the El Tigre Brahm recall, which I animated. And at the end, we're going to have um, uh, plenty of time for Q&A. So if you have any questions regarding the luchador skin line, skins in general, uh, my personal story, Go ahead and post them up on the on the channel, and uh, we can uh, answer those questions at the end. So uh, let's get started. My name again is Jose Hernandez. I am the lead animator for the League of Legends skins team. I have uh, 20 years in game development, and I've been at Riot Games for nine and a half years. Uh, uh, I'm going on almost 10 years. It's been an awesome, awesome, fun ride. Um, I've worked on a lot of skins. So, um, I'm a people, man people manager these days, so I don't really do a lot of animation work, uh, but I have worked on a lot of uh, awesome skins in the past. Uh, animated the original Pulsefire uh, uh, Ultimate Ezreal, worked on some Battlecast skins, uh, Demon Blade Trindamir, Pool Party skins, uh, Star Guardian skins, Arcade skins. And as an animator, I love doing uh, shooting my own video, video reference. Uh, and so like, you know, I always try to find these like, uh, places in the office where I can, uh, shoot some, shoot some cool videos. I've done, uh, the mecha, mecha skins and, uh, and I've also worked on, uh, lots and lots of worlds. First off, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to the Riot Animation Team. Uh, amazing, super, super talented, uh, group of animators. We have our own uh, Twitch TV channel where we, every few weeks we do uh, live demo reels and uh, basic uh, animation discussions. Uh, so uh, follow, follow that and if you, wanna, if you want your demo to be reviewed or if you just wanna check out some of the stuff that we're talking about. And another announcement is that we have our animation internships uh, available for sign up for 2021. We're being super, super proactive and trying to get ahead of, uh, ahead of everything. Uh, so if you are in school and qualify for an internship, go ahead uh, to the uh, Riot Games website. There's a university programs page. You can sign up there. And these two pictures here, the one on the one on the left is actually this year, 2020. It was literally one week before the lockdown. It was uh, the, the last team outing that we had where we were, it, like, I think after that, they, uh, uh, the, the, the offices shut down for like, we, we were all work from home after that. So, that was basically like the last time we were able to all like be in each other's presence. Uh, we went to we went to a, a really awesome uh, VR experience. Um, the one of the picture on the right hand side is obviously during uh, during this crazy time we did a social distancing hike in the Santa Monica Mountains. So I hope we can do another one of those hikes. That uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, this is an amazing, amazing, talented uh, group of people that I have uh, the pleasure and honor to work with every single day. Um, so, going into a little bit of my story, my professional background, uh, I am Mexicano uh, from the northern state of Nuevo León, and uh, but uh, our family moved up to the U.S. when I was one year old. So I basically grew up in Texas in uh, Fort Worth, um, and I moved out to uh, Los Angeles, where I currently live in California, November third, two thousand and three. I remember that date because that's basically uh, a big, a big uh, life shift for me. Uh, so one of the awesome things about uh, uh, being Latinx and, and having a, a diverse background is being able to enjoy all the different things. I love my Me Mexicano side. I also love, uh, you know, being an American and I love being uh, the, you know, I love Texas as well. You know, give me, give me a cowboy hat. Uh, I will definitely jump onto, jump onto a horse. Um, uh, but I also love this whole California vibes, you know, like LA, I, I, I lived here for many, many years now, and I, and I really, really love it. So for me, this whole story of my life and, and all the different places where I'm from is something that I really, really love to embrace and, and uh, keep, uh, keep as a positive aspect of, of uh, my history. Um, so I get a lot of these questions on 
how I became an animator. I'm, uh, I'm at this point, I'm, I'm 44 years old. I'm uh, a, lot, a lot older uh, than I look. I grew up uh, in, uh, I was born in 76, and I grew up in the early 80s. So my first gaming experience at home was uh, definitely Atari 2600. And, um, and later on, it was there was N Nintendo. Uh, but I never thought that I would be a game developer. I never thought that I would be an artist. You know, I, I liked, you know, just as every, all kids love video games, all kids love creating art. Um, but that was never something that I told myself that, you know, I want to be, uh, I want to make video games. You know, back then it was very, very different. It was, it wasn't what it is uh, now. The, there was no industry the, that we have now. So uh, my up upbringing was very, just pretty, pretty normal. I, I did uh, have, uh, I did, uh, was raised by a single mom. My dad died when I was one year old. So it was a very, very small family. Um, other than that, it was pretty average, not super, super exciting. Um, as I got a little bit older, um, you know, I, got, I was playing Sega Genesis. I had that, um, but I didn't have a, a full um, perspective of who I was. I was in Boy Scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, that was basically my whole teenage years. I was in Scouts for 11 years. And it was uh, uh, it basically uh, defined who, who I am. Uh, and it was sort of my father figure. That, that I didn't have as I was growing up. Uh, but after I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went through high school not, still not knowing like th that I wanted to be an artist or anything. I didn't even think about art. I went to junior college after after high school. And the fun fact is I, I flunked out of junior college. Yes, um, not once, but twice. Uh, and uh, so after the second time I flunked out of junior college, I told myself, you know, maybe going to junior college and taking basic courses is not my thing. Uh, so I decided to go ahead and take a break from all that and just uh, get a day job and uh, figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and the next phases of my personal life was uh, were, were super influential. And that's when I uh, discovered that I was an artist. And it all started with uh, uh, embracing a community and embracing an identity. Uh, I met an amazing group of uh, artists, uh, muralists, um, they were actually called the show team, and that's where I get my nickname from, uh, show, uh, because it's, it plays a, uh, it's a homage to that group of, uh, of artists because they had a huge influence in my life. They, they encouraged my individualism. They encouraged my art. Through the course, and it was only a couple of years we were hanging out, uh, but through the course of that, that's when I discovered within myself, I am an artist, and I want to do something art-related, uh, something that's creative-related, uh, and it was... It was just uh, the, the difference. It was a night and day difference between a, a few years. So once I discovered that I was an artist and I wanted to be an artist, uh, the next step was, OK, I want to go to art school. I want to I want to get my degree in something creative. When and I went to the Art Institute of Dallas, when I started art school, I didn't know. I still didn't know I wanted to be an animator. All I knew is I wanted to do something creative in art and uh, and it needs to be with computers. Uh, you know, back when I went to art school, it was, it was 1997. So there was no animation degree, and that was in the PS1 day. So, um, so it just what it isn't what it is uh, now. Uh, so I had to sort of figure out like what exactly I wanted to do, um, and um, and I do remember the exact moment, uh, the exact second that I realized that I was an animator, that I was going to be an animator, and that's that was my calling. And it was uh, when we took uh, when I took my first animation class. Back then, everyone takes all the classes. I, so there's a 3D class, a, an effects class, a motion graphics class. I took an animation class, and our first assignment, which is the animation that you see here, the guy getting up, um, is uh, is all right, guy. Uh, you have to animate someone getting up off of the ground. When I started creating this animation, I was obsessing about the way uh, he's throw. Like you know, for me, I was like, he needs to throw his head up. He needs to pivot with his arm. And then I started obsessing about motion in general, the way people moved. I was looking at the way people moved down the hallways. I was asking myself, what's the story of that walk cycle? Why do they move that certain way? I was, I was paying attention to body language. I was just completely obsessed about motion in general. And that's when it occurred to me. And I had, a, I had a, just this, the, it was like the sky opening up and this realization moment saying, you know what? I think I'm an animator. I, I am an animator. And then, and it, and it was awesome because my life completely changed after I told myself I was an animator. I, I 
stop focusing on modeling or learning how to do effects or any of that stuff and focusing just on motion, just on just on character motion. Um, and it was huge. Inside of school, uh, we I started to play a lot, a lot of games. Age of Empires was was a huge game, some first person shooters. Um, and inside of that, there was a community in, in uh, in the school that played a lot of games. So we were playing games till 2 a.m. until the school was closing, doing LAN parties, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then when that happened, I also told myself, you know what, I wanna get into gaming. I am a game developer. I don't wanna get into film. Uh, I wanna create life uh, and, I wanna, and I, wanna, I, I wanna be able to hit a button and bring something to life, which is what ga game development is. Uh, so, uh, so that was huge for anyone that's uh, trying to figure out what they wanna do or, or what they want to focus on, um, I think finding finding uh, and embracing what you're obsessing about, and, and and also just telling yourself, I am this. Like I am an animator. That's that's the first step in becoming an animator. Uh, I am a character artist. I am a designer. Uh, I am a doctor. I I am a firefighter. You know, you have to tell yourself that. Once you tell yourself that, everything else is going to fall into. So that's sort of uh, my story and uh, how I became uh, an animator. Um, my professional timeline, I graduated the Art Institute of Dallas in 2000. Uh, uh, very quickly, I got a job at uh, Rogue Entertainment, another studio in Dallas, Ritual Entertainment in Dallas as well. Then I had an opportunity at EA Games, and that's, what, um, and, and that's how I landed in, in LA. And then I worked at Tech and Color for quite a few years. They started up a gaming division uh, inside of their studio. And then obviously Riot Games. I've been uh, here since uh, 2011, uh, and and uh, it's been it's been awesome. These are some of the games that I've I've worked on. Um, a lot of Medal of Honor games. Uh, you know, animating uh, like a guy holding a weapon shooting. Uh, that's my jam. Uh, uh, I I've got that on the lockdown. Uh, but it's been a a very diverse uh, uh, field of games. A lot of PC games. But obviously, uh, League of Legends, Riot Games has had the the biggest influence in, in my in my whole career. So enough about me. Let's get into the creation of the Luchador skin line. First off, um, you know what what is a skin for anyone that uh, is not familiar with League of Legends? We have uh, champions, uh, what we call champions. These are characters in a game that you can choose to um, you can choose to play uh, in our map. Each one of those characters has what we call our, our, the base, which is who, who the champion just is. Um, and uh, a skin for that champion is basically a new thematic for that champion. It includes an, uh, VFX, uh, a new model, uh, some new animations, uh, and, it, and, it, um, and it's just basically a, a, another realization of that champion. Right here is uh, Mundo on his base. He's a sort of uh, crazy looking purple skin guy that sticks out his tongue. Um, and then we decided to give him a luchador skin, which uh, which brings him into that universe. And uh, you know he's wearing a mask. Uh, so so th that's a difference uh, between the base champ and and a skin. And and that's a team that I'm on is uh, the skins team. Uh, so here is the Luchador skin lineup. These were these are older skin skins. They were created in 2015 and 2016. Uh, down the line here we have Ed Leon Nar. He's this cute little and and the base is on the top and the skin is at the bottom. Obviously, he's a he's a cute little uh, creature. I I don't really know exactly what he is. He looks almost like a fox type of creature. But uh, one of the one of the things that he does is he transforms uh, into this like a raging monster. So he has two models, uh, and um, we have El Tigre Brahm as well, which we're, we're going to get into a little bit later. Uh, we have El Rayo Polar Bear, which is basically a big polar bear-looking um, uh, champion that has uh, uh, electricity type of effects. Uh, and uh, what we saw earlier, we have El Macho Mundo, uh, and, and he's, that, he's that crazy purple-skinned uh, wild-looking character. So here, here's the lineup. Um, how, and uh, and I'm going to describe some of our process, processes on how skins are created at um, uh, at Riot Games on League of Legends. Um, we want to uh, when we first get into a thematic, we want to identify what the pillars are. And the pillars are basically what what does this thematic mean? What are the most important parts of this thematic? So getting into this Lucha Libre skin line, uh, we we identified it's yes, it's a traditional uh, Mexican wrestling. 
uh, one of the main parts of this whole skin line is that there are these over the top uh, action-y high flying stunts that are happening. So things are things are just sort of wild and crazy all over the place. Uh, masks is a huge thing. So if we're gonna make skins for for this uh, skin line, you know, they all have to pretty much be wearing masks. And uh, and uh, the, the the main thing is that this it's a colorful, over the top thematic. There's a lot of bling. There's a lot of shiny stuff, glitter sequins, and it's very very uh, performance driven uh, stuff. Which is which is uh, why I was very excited when we were uh, making these skins because uh, uh, inside of League of Legends, inside of our universe, it's very very broad, and there is. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, a lot of our champs are high flying champs. They, they do jumps and teleports and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there was a lot of opportunity in this skin line. I was super excited when we started creating the skins. Um, so some of the processes on how our skin is made is a step one. We do we do a brainstorming session and we go into the concept phase. Um, the brainstorming session can be done in a few different ways. Uh, we 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 have like what we call a blue sky, which we sort of just throw out all these crazy ideas. Sometimes we choose the champion beforehand, uh, and then uh, and then just do a spread of uh, of, of uh, different types of uh, ideas for that champ. Sometimes we we do a spread of champs and just add a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, outfits to all those champs to try to figure figure it out. In the case of uh, Mundo, I think uh, we we decided that yes, we're going to do a skin for Mundo. Um, and uh, so we went straight into the concept phase on that. And uh, in the concept phase, that's when we're talking about uh, all the different props that we need. Uh, and, and sometimes we also concept out um, effects. Um, as you can see on the bottom left, we have a um, little, uh, little Nar. He has some props as well. And we concept it out. Volibear, Bear, uh, he actually, this is a color spread on Volibear. Bear. So we were trying to figure out all the different outfits that he needed to have. Um, and on the top right hand side, that that would that's the character spread. So we're just sort of like figuring out who who inside of our universe can can be applied uh, to the thematic. And and there are many many characters that can that can fall into the lucha uh, libre uh, thematic. In the center, we have uh, we have El Tigre Brom. We'll, we'll get into him a little bit later, so I won't uh, go to super detailed onto it. The next uh, stage in production is the modeling and rigging stage. And when I say the next stage, it's not necessarily the concept artist is like, I'm, I'm done, now here's, here's the model that you have to model for my concept. Uh, all the work sort of start, happens uh, overlapping with each other simultaneous. Sometimes a modeler will start um, blocking out or spiking out, uh, creating a, a rough model. So, so the rigger can start creating a rough rig. So the animator can start creating a rough animation. So, so work does happen simultaneously. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm just sort of presenting them as the next step. Um, but these are all the uh, different models for uh, the Lucha Libre skin line and uh, the skeletons that they have underneath. Um, El Tigre, Brahm, he's got a lot of props. So those are uh, his props there on the right hand side. So the next phase in production, which is uh, obviously my personal favorite fa phase, it, uh, it is the animation phase. Um, for skins for League of Legends, we uh, they usually get uh, what we call recalls. A recall is when you teleport back to base. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, when we create a skin, uh, they'll get a custom recall that, that with the goal of uh, telling the story of what this skin line is. Back in 2015 and 2016, we had a, a, a lower tier price point for these skins that were, uh, they, I think they were called 750 skins. Uh, it, but so the NAR on the right hand side and Volibear, those are, those are actually the base recalls. Uh, they're not custom recalls for the skin line. But as you can see, the base recall still hit those pillars that I was mentioning. Uh, there's a pillar there. One of the pillars was uh, strength and high flying uh, stunt. So uh, a little gnar on the right hand side. He's he's jumping around. He's throwing his little uh, his little weapon. He's doing some cutesy moves, and so that supports the the pillars of the thematic, and it also supports his base champion. And Volibear shows this uh, these the strength. He's you know he's all about this electricity thing. So he's so he slams the ground. He does this crazy move. He's he's just he and and then he teleports up. So it also fits the thematic. Um, El Macho Mundo here on the left hand side. That's a custom recall that I animated for uh, this thematic. Um, and one of the goals on this recall was supporting the pillars again. Um, and uh, and so part of part of uh, 
uh, Mundo's bass personality, he has this sort of crazy vibe to him. He's always sticking out his tongue. He's a little wild. So what I wanted to do was um, have him, um, have him uh, scream, stick out his tongue. He, he's got his weapon and he's like bashing his own head with it. You know, just some weird stuff that doesn't make sense. Um, and then I also wanted to apply some high flying action stunts with it. So I chose, hey, he should just jump up and do this crazy, awesome elbow drop. Uh, and that's sort of how I created the, the idea for the custom recall for, uh, for, um, for Mundo there. So the next, uh, the next phase is uh, our VFX. Sometimes it, sometimes it uh, can be confused with the animation. But effects are basically uh, anything that is not uh, the actual character or animated props. Um, and and that that does mean that it's the um, the, the lightning effects, fire, uh, anytime anytime you see these glowy bits, those are those are effects, and those effects uh, also need to support the pillars. And you can see uh, at Macho Mundo there, he's got this fiery effect that uh, uh, hurts the um, the champions when you're when you're fighting them, and it's, they're shaped as a fist. He also has a weapon, and one of his spells, he actually throws his weapon at you. And we wanted to have him. Um, I remember when we were working on it. We wanted to. He wanted to hold, uh, or wanted him to hold a chair. Uh, but we also had these cool ideas uh, where he he's holding a belt and he like slaps you with a belt. And then someone said, "Hey, he should hold a club like with barbed wire on it." And then he like smashes you with that as well. So what wound up happening was that uh, was that we chose to give him uh, weapon swaps. Every time he throws out his weapon, we talked to one of the designers to to help create this. Every time he throws out his his uh, his weapon, it swaps to a different weapon. So not only does he have one uh, that one cool weapon, he's got multiple weapons. So those uh, that's just another way that we try to add something exciting to some of these skins that are created. Um, on in the middle there, uh, Volo Bear and um, and Nar. Uh, because of the lower price point, they didn't they didn't get the um, the custom effects, but all of the effects that they do have do support uh, the pillars. And now on the right hand side there, we have um, we have the effects for uh, El Tigre Brom. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that a, a, a little bit, uh, but but uh, we created a, we created a, a, this this glowy chair that he hits you with, and uh, an ultimate that should that looks sort of like a, a ring, uh, the corner of a ring coming up. Uh, so after basically after uh, all the production stuff is done, uh, it goes into the next phase, uh, which is a splash art. And splash artists, uh, uh, they are super super talented. A lot of awesome people that we work with uh, at the office. These splash the splash arts actually uh, probably got started somewhere earlier in the middle of production on all these skins. Um, but the, one of the goals of the splash art is to uh, tell a story. It's storytelling. And it's basically uh, it, it's used as a promotional piece. It's used as a as a communication piece to all of our players of as to who this champion is. Um, in one image, you need to understand what's happening, who the champ is. Uh, so on the left hand side, we decided to do a group uh, splash where we uh, have multiple characters inside of one image. And as you can see, that recall animation, that elbow drop that I created, I was. Uh, Chatting with a splash artist there, and I was like, you know, he should he should be flying in the air because I because of that animation. Let's show that in the splash. So this splash, uh, I, you know, has a preview of what you're actually going to see in game for um, El Macho Mundo there. And for Nar, he does this rage. Uh, he rages out and does this transformation. So it's showing that in the middle. And for Volo Bear, he's got those um, those uh, lightning effects on that's uh, that's being showcased there on the left hand side. So um, on the right hand side, we have the splash for Digita Brom, uh, and um, and it show and it shows uh, his essence and his personality. He's inside of a ring because you can see the you can see the the corner there, and he's in a stadium and he's and he's and he's uh, show he's like showing his personality. There's a cape and he's just showing everyone how awesome he is, and and it's a and it's a the, and it's basically capturing that story. So the splash is a super important. Uh, aspect of this whole thing, uh, but that's basically every all everything from from the beginning to the end on how skins are uh, created. So let's uh, dive into the Elti de Brom uh, animation uh, deep dive. 
Um, and aw awesome thing about this skin is uh, the uh, Mexico City, we have regional offices all over the country, Mexico City there. Uh, they, they created a statue for this skin and put it in their office. Uh, I, I have uh, not visited the Mexico City office, but I would love to go take a selfie with that statue because, uh, again, this is one of my fav favorite skins uh, that, that, that I've worked, worked on. Um, uh, you know, j just like uh, I was explaining before that uh, we're, we're, we need to make sure that we're capturing the base uh, character of this skin, um, you know, we need to ask ourselves who, who, uh, who Brahm is, who's, who's the base champion, uh, and what are his pillars? Uh, pillars is a definitely um, uh, one of the things that, that you know, the, the quote pillars is, a, is one of the things that we apply in game development as, a, as these key definers of these characters. So one of the pillars for um, for Brom is that he's a protector. He's in he's what we call in our game a support. He plays uh, bottom lane with with uh, uh, an ADC that's main goal is to attack. Uh, so Brom is 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 a defender, and that's why he has this awesome shield. And the shield is one of the most important aspects of Brom. So um, any skin that we create, we need to really focus on what the shield is, the importance of the shield, and how it's going to interact with Brom and and uh, with that thematic. And then he also, his archetype is a strong character, super strong, uh, he heroic, he's just a uh, hero character. And he has a, you know, look at his face, he's got a friendly vibe too, like he, he's opening his hand, he's, he's, uh, he's here to help you and, and defend for you. Uh, you know, and here's Brom, uh, base Brom in game, uh, on top of being this, um, this sort of strong ar archetype and defender, he also has this jovial quality to him. So one of his joke animations is that he's on the ground and he's flipping his, uh, his shield around with uh, his little character Poro. And Poro, uh, the Poro there is his, basically his little sidekick. And he's um, uh, in his cinematic, in his, one of his release cinematics, he's actually defending the Poro. Uh, and you know, the Poro actually became its own character, its own meme. We have a bunch of Poro skins, we have Poro wards, and it, and it became one of those awesome things inside of uh, League of Legends, but it was, uh, it was born within this uh, champion. Uh, so Poro and Braum, are, are, they're, they're like side by side. Um, and as you can see, you know, I'm sort of identifying some of the important aspects of, of, of base Braum itself. And on the top uh, right, like his shield, like, you know, he's, He's known mostly for for shielding stuff. Uh, and he's also he has this amazing ult where he slams the ground and uh, shoots out this thing and pops up uh, pops up the enemy champions. And he's and, and he has this uh, ice thematic as well. So uh, so um, you can see you can see his ultimate on on the bottom. Uh, but yeah, this is sort of uh, basically capturing everything that Braum is all about. That we need to make sure that we also capture when we're creating uh, the skin. So like I was saying before, the first, the first section is the brainstorming and concept section. Uh, at that point, we're, I was, uh, we're working in a small group and uh, 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 an amazing uh, Latinx game developer, Oscar Monteon, uh, he is a, a great character artist. Uh, and um, not only is he an awesome character artist, he also does concept. Uh, so uh, when we when uh, we um, when they came to us uh, and told us that we were going to be create, creating these skins, we were both super excited about the skin line because uh, because you know why not? Like this is it's a lucha libre skins. I've been wanting to make lucha libre skins for League of Legends ever since I started uh, at, at Riot. So we're super excited uh, to to work on this thematic together. Uh, and and start to come up with some cool ideas. And one of the one of the things one of the first things that we were talking about is what's a, all right. What's a shield going to be? You know, he's all about the shield. What's a shield going to be? Uh, we had the idea of you know, is it going to be this like stone type of um, thing with like his uh, like a mask in the front? Is it just going to be a just a giant lucha libre mask that he's holding like strapped to his uh, uh, like a strapped to his arm? Um, one idea was that he's holding the belt, like he's holding this like this belt that he just won, and it's got the and it's got the El Tigre motif on it. Um, those are all great ideas, and would have looked awesome too. Uh, but we also had another idea, where is where maybe he's holding a chair, and and we started to gravitate on that chair idea because uh, for me as an animator, I'm always looking for things that can move, things that I that we can interact with. Uh, so when when the chair idea came up, I was like, yes, like 
yeah, he should be holding a chair and then he throws the chair and then he can, then he can like open it up and he can use it as a prop and do all, all kinds of stuff. And in, in, um, in wrestling chair, you know, obviously chairs are huge, you know, people are smashing chairs with. Them. So we, we, we went for the chair um, and, um, and we also wrapped it in barbed wire because it's, it's not only a defensive weapon where he's, the, uh, where he's using it to block stuff, but he also uses it as, a, as an offensive weapon. Uh, so that's sort of how we created the chair uh, idea, and um, and uh, the funny thing, you, if you look at the little um, little Poro there, we did give him an, an awesome awesome mustache, which I'm sort of jealous of because I I can't grow a mustache, um, but uh, but uh, we're also concepting out effects as well, uh, and if we look at some of these effects, uh, uh, we we uh, thought to ourselves, all right, uh, this is what it's going to look like when we're shooting the chair out, or this is possibly like, this is a, like a dig to head, like coming at you to bite you. Uh, there was a crazy idea where, where, um, where um, a giant folding table comes up, like for the recall or something, a giant folding table comes up and then Timo strapped to it. And then he does this like jump and smashes through Timo and breaks apart. Um, that that, that would have been cool, but you know, I, I think there's some gameplay <laughs> implications on having these characters uh, interacting. Uh, and I think the image on the uh, the bottom right hand side that's one of the uh, that's that was a first pass on on the ultimate uh, as well that we wanted to show a ring and like that he's smashing through through the ring and coming up. Uh, so as it's going into my my section, uh, the animation section, one of one of the things that I like to do as an animator um, is uh, shoot or, or, or always look for video reference. Um, I think uh, you know. I almost never go into animation without just like looking at stuff, like looking at the reference. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, I know that there's high flying action and I, and I sort of know what the stuff looks like, but I'm searching online. And this is one of the funnest parts, you know, when we're doing uh, dance explorations, we're just, I'll spend two days just doing, just searching. And I'm looking for stuff that's memorable. I'm looking for maybe memes. I'm looking for things that, that people can gravitate to, uh, to come up with these cool ideas. Um, and one of the and obviously one of the, one of the uh, thematic pillars was um, was uh, this high flying uh, action. So I chose to do uh, keep it a little bit simple because he's sort of big, uh, and I opted for a elbow drop instead of just like this crazy crazy back flips and stuff. Um, then after that, um, we had uh, I drew out uh, basically like what's going to happen here. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna. He's gonna throw the chair down. He's gonna look at the the little the little uh, little guy and say like, "Come at me, bro!" And then he's gonna like jump, a, a run up uh, on the corner of the ring and do an elbow drop. Um, and he can't. And we opted for him not actually hurting the poro because he's supposed to be defending the poro. So at the end, the poro jumps out of the way and he smashes onto the ground. Um, along with shoot, uh, looking for reference, I always shoot my own reference if I can. Uh, so I got the reference for the high flying action, that, that idea. So and I wanted to get a bunch of like character reference, like what, you know, what, what's his body language going to be? And that's when I just set up the camera and start recording myself. And and I'm I'm doing everything from like you know I'm going to slice your neck, to to pointing down to like you know uh, uh, you know vibing up the the crowd and everything. Uh, so uh, these are these are just some of the tools that I, that I use, but I definitely recommend anyone getting into animation shoot your own reference or look at reference. Um, we created props for these uh, and a little, uh, little insider secret there. Uh, when, we're, when we create the props, sometimes we have them down in the ground and then they pop up uh, for when we need them there. So that's sort of where, where they live as we're working on them. And then we use, uh, obviously we use uh, three um, uh, Maya as our animation tool. The first step in animation is what I call the blocking stage. Uh, and that's basically setting the key poses for what this character, what this animation is going to be. Uh, one of the main goals is uh, setting these poses so the uh, the pod and the team can get sign off and buy off as to the idea that 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 uh, I'm presenting. So just looking at the key poses here, you can tell what's happening. There. The next phase is we call blocking two. It's still poses. But it's basically adding all the little in betweens to all the poses, and as you can see, it's a little bit more flushed out. You can see a little bit more detail. The next step after that, uh, we get out of the posing phase and we go into what we call splining phase, adding more 
keyframe and smoothing out the animation. It, it looks like it's almost there, but if you pay attention, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be adjusted on this. And basically, the last, uh, the last section is finalizing, finishing it up, getting adding all the little detail, getting if there's cloth, hair uh, animation, just getting everything. And as you can see, here is the final animation in Maya. And here is uh, the final animation in game with the recall ring. Um, and uh, we do this last, this last step. We export it out and make sure everything is working properly. The props are, are coming up out of the ground properly uh, and that the, the game engine is, is also compressing our animation correctly. Um, we did add one additional animation to this, uh, to, this, um, to this set here, and it's a spawn animation. And this was created by an awesome animator, Drew Morgan. Uh, on the skins team. Uh, he has this cape, uh, but we didn't want to have him ha uh, with the cape on the whole time because he because uh, it was going to get in the way of, of the character. And that's so some of the stuff that we need to think about from our top-down view, uh, how, how these designs uh, affect uh, the, the character, uh, readability and clarity. Uh, so we, what we decided is that he has an intro. Let's give him an intro like he's going into the, into the stage, like he's, like, like he's joining the arena. Yeah. So every time you die and he comes back to life, he's he he throws off his cape. He does this cool this cool like flare move, and it's basically his Adidabram wrestling intro. Uh, a lot of fun, and these are some of the other ways that we can apply uh, cool animations to to our skins. So here's everything in game. Here's the the custom effects, the 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 wrestling ring uh, ultimate, and here is uh, my animation. Uh, so yeah, that's basically uh, all the. I know this presentation is super super quick, and that's it, but that's basically the, all the different steps and processes on the creation of uh, skins in game and the creation of the lucha libre skin line. Muchas gracias. Thank you everybody for uh, for checking out my presentation. And uh, now uh, I think we have about uh, a little over twenty minutes for some Q and A. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go through some of the, some of the questions that that I'm checking out here. Um, have a, a great question. Um, what's uh, what's been my favorite project uh, to work on and why? Uh, being on um, uh, that that's that's a great question. You know, being being on uh, League of Legends for so long, I've I've been able to work on a lot of different. Uh, type of stuff and and uh, and, uh, and the skins that we're making these days are just over the top. They are beautiful pieces of art. They are the, of the most high quality. Uh, one and and I love working on all, all of our newer stuff. But but one of the uh, one of my favorite projects is actually an old project. It's a, it it's um it was the um, it was a creation of the Pulse Fire the original Pulse Fire Ezreal Ultimate skin. Uh, years later, uh, Ezreal got a got a whole visual upgrade, so it, it all got redone. But we originally created it. Um, I think it was 2013, maybe. It was a long time ago, um, and 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 the quality was great. Uh, it, it was very different than the work that we do now. But what I really liked about that, um, working on that, uh, was not necessarily the actual animations. But the process of the creation of that skin uh, during that time, uh, we were experiencing massive, massive player growth. We're also being very experimental with our skins. We were discovering a lot of new stuff, uh, discovering what legendary skins were. <clears throat> so when uh, when I had a chance to to work on Pulse Fire Ezreal, that skin was originally a, a, a lower. It was sort of a normal type of skin, um, and then. Um, and then we discovered that we can we can make the skin a little bit bigger and a little bit better, and so we so we turned it into a legendary skin. And I, I made a bunch of new animations. And then when we were creating uh, that legendary skin, we asked ourselves, "Hey, can this be a little bit more? Can we create a new tier?" Uh, so that's what was the most exciting about working on that skin is that we actually invented a new skin line. We invented the ultimate skin with that skin. And that was um, uh, and that was uh, very very um, it was very driven by the the group of, of artists and designers working on that. Uh, the goal was creating something fresh uh, of high quality and uh, trying out something new. Uh, and and to me that that's a 
that's a memorable time, not only in Riot history, but also in my career because, uh, you know, having the privilege to invent a new skin line is all is, you know, that that lasts for, for a really long time. So that's one of one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, skin lines. Uh, fun fact, the, the backpack that Pulsefire Ezreal has, that's, that was uh, originally designed off of one of my personal backpacks. It's like a hard shell motorcycle backpack. I brought it into the office. I was wearing it and I was like, hey, you know, the backpack should should be like hard shell like this and like had these little things that come up and these jet packs. Uh, so it was a lot of fun working on that, uh, working on that skin light. Um, so um, uh, taking, uh, taking uh, another question here, I have a question on uh, uh, how long does it take to deliver a single animation uh, versus a whole uh, thematic release? Uh, so uh, that's a that's a that's a great question, um, and uh, the answer to that is that a single animation is a, is a, at a different scale and time length to that of a whole thematic release. Release when we're doing a whole thematic release, there are a lot of um, a lot of teams involved. We have multiple skins, we have promotional teams, we have audio teams. Maybe there's custom music. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we have multiple splash artists, so so it's it's a huge endeavor, huge co cross collaboration endeavor, and, and which can take several months to complete. An actual uh, actual animation uh, itself inside of that it all depends on the uh, on on the actual skin. Uh, what we have now uh, are thirteen fifty price point skins. Uh, a lot of times they just have a recall animation. <clears throat> So the time length to create a recall animation um, within our studio is, is mm, it depends on the animator, uh, but you know maybe one to two weeks. It, it sort of it really does depend on the animator. It does it also depends on the actual recall animation itself. Um, so, but but they are very very separate things. If you can think about a whole thematic release as just being this like, giant package, and then an animation is just one little section uh, in that package. Um, uh, I have an awesome, uh, uh, I have an awesome question. Um, if I was to choose uh, one champion, uh, I, who would I be? Uh, so uh, you, you know, I think I am personally very, very. Uh, uh, I like to do a lot of different types of things, so I actually uh, uh, relate to a lot of different uh, types of champions. Um, but I, but I do have a sort of uh, you know, I'm an, I'm one of those like introvert extrovert guys, you know, uh, and I have a sort of showboaty uh, like flair to me, I guess. Uh, so I so I do like uh, I think when Draven came out, I instantly gravitated to Draven because he's because he's like you know he's super showboaty and he's and he's like you know this like flashy champ and I just I was like that that guy's cool. I you know I want to I want to be him like super cool and um, <clears throat> and. And I also uh, my main main is uh, is AD is ADC bottom lane, which is what Draven is all about. So I think Draven was one one of my, but I, but but I can relate to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of champions. Um, we have uh, there's a, a great question on um, on portfolios uh, uh, on uh, uh, what uh, what kind of portfolio grabs the attention of of Riot. Um, so the thing, the thing about portfolios and when we're looking at portfolios is, is, is that um, they're very catered to the team that, that you're going to be uh, applying to. Uh, for example, uh, when on the skins team or just basically League of Legends animation, gameplay animation, uh, what I always look for in portfolios are uh, not only uh, people that can do uh, acting pieces, uh, uh, maybe some facial animation, you know, that stuff is great. But what I really, really look for, um, what I really, really look for, uh, what the team looks for is someone that understands uh, a really high impact sense of timing, uh, attack moves, uh, run cycles, basically game game assets, because that's the work that, 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 that we're doing. So we, so we look for portfolios that, that are that are catered towards game assets. Uh, not that you can't have the cinematic stuff. That's great because uh, showing some some high quality, very fine tuned um, animations that are catered to a camera that does showcase your your 
your skills as well. But we look for game uh, we look for game uh, game uh, centric portfolios because the game the job is uh, is game get game development. So if you're looking to join. Uh, the biggest advice I could give you, if you're looking to join, uh, apply to a studio, whether whatever studio it is, the portfolio should represent the work that the studio is looking for. If it's a cinematics company, then obviously you should show cinematics work. If it's game development, let's see some game development stuff. Um, uh, so a uh, good question, personal question. Um, if I was not an animator, uh, what would I uh, be doing instead? Uh, so, uh, I, I actually almost got, got out of, uh, game development, uh, before I started Riot Games. When I started, when I, when I found Riot Games in 2010 and started to do my research, it was really, uh, a company that was doing things a little bit differently. Um, and it was very super player focused, a live game. Um, so, uh, so it brought me back into game development in one of the best choices, decisions of my life. Uh, but at, but before I started at Riot, I almost went into the food industry, um, and uh, all my coworkers know uh, I I I I have a salsa label like fire roasted salsa, the salsa that you that you eat. I have a whole I have a whole label, and it's literally the best salsa you ever had. Uh, everyone says the same thing. I'm you know that's what they tell me. Uh, but uh, but I make salsa, uh, and I and I take it to my coworkers, and I give it all out, uh, and that's one of the things that I share with. So. And you know, I always tell myself, in a, you know, once I, once 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 my animation creativity is is all drained out, maybe I'll get into the food industry. Um, on top of that, I also have a Etsy store selling vintage clothing, and I have my own, um, and I'm also do do some fashion design and starting up my own my own fashion brand as well. So I like to stay busy. I like ha having uh, not one side hustle, but three side hustles. So there's a lot you know that that I would like to do, um, and I wish I could clone myself and and do it all. Um, cool, uh, great question here. Uh, what kind of reference do do you do I use if I cannot uh, reproduce uh, the reference myself? So um, you know I love shooting my own reference. If I can act it out myself, even if it's a character that isn't like shaped like me or even even like a quadruped like i i'll get on my hands and knees and start acting it out but there is um there is obviously reference that i can't do or i don't have the facilities to do like like you know jumps and like crazy deaths where people are you know landing on the ground things like that and um it all depends on the the um it all depends on the actual uh animation itself you know what what I what I try to do is balance out. Uh, I go into looking for reference with a rough idea, but I, I let the reference actually guide me as well. I don't. I'm not. A, when I when when I'm looking for outside reference and I have this like locked in idea of exactly what I want, that's usually when I can't find it because because I'm limiting myself. So I go into looking for reference with an open mind, uh, and and I, I and I like I said I look for things that are popular and popular culture, things that resonate, things that are uh, maybe funny, things that are high impact, th uh, things that are high quality. It all, it all depends, but I try to let the reference help guide me because, um, because yes, I am the animator creating the animation, but I'm also a vessel to the emotion that's, that's, uh, and the story that this character is gonna have. And that story comes from, can come from the reference. I'm just the person that sort of, you know, Gets gets that information uh, through. So I try to keep an open mind when I'm uh, looking uh, for uh, reference. Um, so I have a I have a great question about uh, interns, uh, interning at Riot. Like, what's it what's it like to be an intern at Riot? Um, I uh, I think uh, I, I haven't been an intern at Riot, uh, but from what I've seen our our program, interning at Riot is a lot of fun. Uh, when you are an intern at Riot, you're not just uh, you know sitting in the corner. Um, this this year is obviously a little weird; everyone's work from home. Uh, but when we're in a normal studio, the intern isn't just sitting in the corner, you know, doing their intern animation, uh, and 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 we're just creating our skins. Uh, 
uh, we actually embed the interns into our production. We embed the interns into our development, into our pods, and we embrace them as team members. Uh, so, uh, and we and we treat them as equal uh, as any other any other developer on on the floor. Um, and one of the awesome parts about the way we work as a studio is that uh, we embrace all ideas, um, and, uh, uh, and and it's part of our uh, how we're structured. We have we have what we call pods, and inside of that pod, we have people of all all different disciplines. Uh, so when we're creating a skin and coming up with cool skin uh, ideas and, and things inside of skins, it's not just, uh, for example, it's not just the animator coming up with the recall animation. It's it can it can be the concept artist. It can be the QA person. It can be the um, the even even the producers too. Like it's 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 everyone sort of coming together and coming up with cool ideas. So as an intern, you can actually come up with amazing ideas. That that can that can influence the team and your cool ideas as an intern go into the game. Uh, we try to uh, we try to have the intern as integrated as, as much po possible, and um, try to have them also working on something that could potentially ship um, to our players in, in the future as well. Uh, but I'm I'm really um, I'm really happy with our internship program, and I want to give it I want to give a shout out to everyone that's involved. In the recruiting aspects of that, and the organization, it is a super, super strong program, and I highly, highly, um, uh, uh, I highly recommend it to any any uh, artist in the industry. Um, here, le let me see. We have a few minutes left. Um, let's see. What? Um, here's one. What's been the most difficult thing? to overcome in your career. I think, um, uh, you know, one, we all have our own personal stories. We all have our own personal challenges, right? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, my difficulties may not apply to, to every single uh, uh, person uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I think what I was, when I was talking about my, my, uh, my, my school time, and I think, uh, and it goes back to before even school. I think one of the most difficult things that I have uh, uh, experienced was is figuring it, uh, figuring it out who who you are, like what you want to be. I think that that uh, sometimes uh, we can get get lost in that, uh, and I think that uh, that we can, and there you know, and there's a fear maybe of embracing that. Like there's a, you know, maybe. There's a fear of, of embracing being an animator because of the pressure and all that and all, and all that stuff. I think that that uh, that's one of the things that, that that we should all look for for overcoming within ourselves is that identity of 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 who you are in this world. You know, not just game development, who you are in this world. Um, another big thing that that I that, that I embrace as a, as an overcoming thing uh, is also uh, not letting yourself. Uh, uh, get down, you know, not blaming yourself for your mistakes, but but also uh, but growing from your mistakes. You know, when I flunked out of junior college twice, I could have blamed myself and just felt sorry for myself and said, I'm not I'm not fit to do anything. But you know what? I, I looked at it different. I said, you know, that's a learning thing. What I learned is that taking basics and going to junior college was not for me. And I didn't I needed to if I'm if I'm going to go to school, and focus. It needs to be something that I'm truly passionate about, and that's the takeaway I learned from that. And my career also in game development also ha hasn't been perfect either. I've had ups and downs, uh, and one of the things about those ups and downs um, that the where where in the end you will continue to go up is 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 when you embrace your mistakes and learn from them. Is when is when you self reflect and and look back at why something failed. Why 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 didn't you get that promotion? Or why didn't you get this? Why why would this happen? Because um, what I've learned is that you know the you know you are in control. Like we are always in control of everything. Uh, you uh, whether whether you uh, uh, you know you 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 control the narrative of your life. So you can take any situation and make sure that you learn from that and and uh, and uh, and grow from it. So I think those are those are generally some of the things that. That can that you know has held me back in the past, and, and what I always try to 
to work on uh, is is uh, learning and growing from any mistake <laughs> any mistake that I have. Um, let me see if we have uh, another um, another question here. Here's a question about um, uh, portfolios uh, regarding uh, a polish or work in progress. Uh, uh, when we're looking at portfolios, we want to we definitely want to see very highly polished work. Uh, but sometimes it's also good to show works in progress, uh, basically showing the blockout phase, uh, showing uh, your process phase. Uh, that's really awesome to see because not only do we see this this really cool uh, final animation, uh, we see um, uh, we we see how you came up with that final animation. Uh, and that really tells us a lot about uh, your thought processes there. It's su super valuable. Uh, so, so if there is an opportunity to add the works in progress inside of your portfolio, it, it, it definitely, uh, you know, it's fine just having the polished piece, but it doesn't hurt to show some, some of your processes and some of the stuff that's going uh, inside of your head as well. Um, cool. Here's, here's, a, um, here's a question about uh, other, other games, uh, TFT and Wild Rift, our interactions with that. Uh, we do have a structure where where the the teams are. We have separate teams for for all, for all of those initiatives. Um, benefits of that is that we're able to to focus. Uh, and there is cross collaboration between uh, some uh, some of those teams when we need to align on a certain on a on a certain thing. Like uh, you know how uh, we have to make sure that the uh, the animations look similar, like that that they are uh, in the same universe. So working on uh, TFT stuff on on the animations, we had to. Uh, I had to, um, you know, talk with some of the animators. We're all sort of, you know, we're all sort of just jamming and talking about some of this stuff in our animation reviews, looking at some of those uh, little legends animations, and making sure it hits the pillars of of what our animation language is for League of Legends. Um, you know, where where in our League of Legends. Does this stuff uh, reside as well? So uh, that's some of the cross collaboration that we have. Is that we want to make sure that that there is alignment on uh, the basics of some um, and some of our uh, some of our products. Um, so um, let me see if there. I think we might be running pretty pretty short on this. Um, okay. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're gonna call it here. Uh, but um, thank you for joining uh, this presentation. It's been an honor uh, talking to you all, and I hope uh, my uh, my talk here inspires uh, inspires anyone to get into game development or animation. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a good day. Adios, gracias.